We have Paul Reiser, Jeanette Goldstein, Rico Ross, and Lance Anderson. The movie played great. It was so much fun seeing it on the big screen again. So, I was telling them before, I think, I think this is probably the best sequel ever made, and I personally think it's actually better than the original, um, which is very, very rare. Um, but at the time this came out, sequels were not quite as like common as they were today, especially seven years later. Um, I just, for each of you guys, like, what, what did you think when you first heard they were making a sequel to Aliens? And um, and also, how did you come to this project, Lance? You want to start? Uh, okay. <laughs> Jeanette, would you like? To... <laughs> Me? Oh. Good. Um. So, well, I um I didn't realize it was a sequel to Aliens. <laughs> what you're laughing? <laughs> this is no. This is good. <laughs> well, I did. I didn't have an agent. I was I was in living in London, and they said that there's a a movie. Um, for it called Aliens, and there were but the reason I didn't think I, for one second I thought, oh yeah, could it be a sequel? But it was like seven, eight years later. Nah. The reason I didn't think it was they were looking for specifically Americans who had a British equity card, and in uh, England your green card is called your resident alien card. Yeah. <laughs> So I just was like, huh, oh, maybe it's about, you know, kind of underground Americans, they marry someone to get their, their, their green card, and that's why. Wait, so were you a local hire? Is that? Yes, is that I was a local hire. Oh, wow, okay. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Lance, you, you've worked with James Cameron before. You, yeah, I did, a couple of times, yeah. You know, when Alien came out, I thought, that's the best movie I've ever seen. I mean, I could smell it. It was so... It really was a great, great departure from getting injected into somebody's arm and going looking for cancer in their body, you know. Uh, and it would, you know what I loved it. You did? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but Alien, Alien was very, this is my girlfriend, by the way, <laughs> in Near Dark. <laughs> but anyway. Ridley Scott had done something that hadn't been done. It was a, a an A movie in about science fiction. You know, I mean, what he did. So I was impressed. And then actually, I was supposed to meet with him, but I was doing Close Encounters, and I was in uh, India, so I never got to do the meeting. So do you remember I'm which glad. Part I'm glad. Up? I'm glad about this. Do you remember which part in the original you were up for? I don't know. <laughs> I, I never look back. I don't know. I have no idea. But but it was. I, it could have been. Could have been a, one or the other. Yeah. Well, I I, I, I think you worked out. You made the right choice. Bishop's a great character. Yeah, I'll go next. I don't want to follow Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Um. It was. It was. Um. It was. Luck that I got the job because I had just gotten cast before this job. I had gotten cast in a Full Metal Jacket, but we hadn't closed on the deal. And then I had seen James before, but you know there was no offer, so I was about to accept the offer for Full Metal Jacket. Uh, and then James said, "Before you accept anything, please come back and see me." So I came back and and we talked, and I and I ended up having to choose because it overlapped one week. And James says, "Well, I'll let you come one week later." If, Kubrick releases you, but Kubrick wouldn't release, so I had to decide. And that there goes the story. <laughs> what, was, what was the part in Full Metal Jacket? Was it a good role? It was a good role, but but the script. I think the script wasn't completely written, and he basically said that you'll be playing Officer or Lieutenant um, Cleveland, and we're going to have these workshops, and whatever you bring to it is what what's going to be in the movie. And you know, as an actor, that, that's a challenge you look for. So I was really and, and James. I mean, as big as James is now. At the time of this movie, James really had wasn't that well known, and Kubrick was very well known. So of course, I was leaning towards the 
Yeah. But you made the right move because not only did Full Metal Jacket overlap with alien, uh, Aliens, it overlapped with everything. It was like a nine-year shoot. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We, and they, were just, they were just tired and they had babies who were growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Two-year shoot. It was a hell of a long shoot. So you got out of there in a couple of months. Yeah, exactly. Well. <laughs> Talking about the alien card, I remember when I, because it was like the biggest thing, and I said, well, I'm in a real movie, this is big time, they have cameras and everything. <laughs> and then and I, when I got on the airport, and then the guy said, uh, uh, resident or alien? I went, man, everybody knows about this movie. <laughs> I didn't know that term. <laughs> did you, Paul, did you audition, or did, they, did he know you were your stand-up worker? I think he had seen me in, I think he had seen me in, Makes no freaking sense at all. <laughs> but I think his his idea was to get somebody that you might not suspect of being evil. Um, and and I auditioned. Not an audition. I think I just met. I don't think there was much to the role. But and then I didn't hear from him for months because so I just assumed it was gone. And four months later, they because they said they had to look at everybody in England. And apparently, there is nobody like me in England, uh, you know, in the entire continent. And so I remember I got, but I had to jog my memories. Remember that? They did the same thing to me. Really? They did. Yeah. I mean, that's the way of getting your price down. That would work. Wait, did you did you read? did you audition or I had to audition? Okay. And I'd already done two movies with Jim, so it was like, really? You know, I was kind of hurt, you know. But uh, I auditioned. I auditioned with the role of Hudson. And he said nobody in England could do what you just did. So that's it. That's what, that's what I was going to ask you guys. With for something like this, did you read for your particular part, or did you read for a bunch of different parts, or like one sense? You read for you read for Hudson. Well, no, actually, um, I read. I, I was told I wasn't reading for Vasquez. I was reading for either the pilot or um, Cynthia's role, feature. I got the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And trim like yes. Them. Wow. Oh yeah. That yeah, was yeah. a good move. That was yeah. Yeah. I, I planned that like three years. Oh, you know, I decided to be a, a gymnast as a young girl when I was eight, and then it, you know. Was, I got into this shape in case something yeah. comes up years from now. Exactly. The long game. I was playing the long game. They need an old, soft, chubby guy. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, think ahead. Had we already ahead. done Pumpkinhead or no? We hadn't done it. We hadn't done it. It had came after. Yeah. That's right. Oh, okay, I got it. And Alec, you had worked with Jim on what, Piranha, maybe? Or uh, no, I was uh, I was no. working at Roger Corman's. Oh, right, right, right. right. With Cameron. No. Nobody Pardon. here worked on Piranha but me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, miss, Piranha I don't even funny. like to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I Piranha miss too. Miss yes. that hey, sport. first of all, I wanna, I, we should thank uh, the USC uh, School of Cinema. What a great event this yeah. is. Yeah. I wanna know, what a great uh, theater. Um, the USC did not accept me into their film school, but I'm happy to be here tonight. <laughs> you, and, you and Steven Spielberg, you're in good company. Yeah, that's exactly how I justified it. It's, no, it's, hard, for me to, it's hard for me to clap for you guys because I'm a Bruin. <laughs> you know, Bruin, Bruin, I, I bleed purple and orange. Thanks for coming, Rico. Um, <laughs> you had know, a plane to catch? <laughs> Anyway, sorry, Alec, how did, so, how did you get involved with this? So, so um, Cameron and I had known each other for about a year prior to starting to work on um, Battle Beyond the Stars, uh, where I met Pat McClung here, and the Skotak brothers and Gail Ann Hurd. Um, and um, so we worked for, I don't know, close to a year on that, and uh, Jim kept talking about a script he had about a robot or something, a metal robot under, under a human skin. It made no sense to me. And, um, I, uh, I, was to, I, I finally found a film school that would take me, so I uh, decided to go that? to... That was UCLA. Oh. <laughs> But I'll tell you what Cameron's parting advice to me was. He said, when I like, I'm, I'm going to go to film school, you know. And he said, I think that's a big mistake. Who needs film school? <laughs> but so, you go ahead. Who yeah. said that? Cameron. And look how he turned out. He told you that. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. Oh boy. So um, you know what I think it was? I think he wanted he wanted to continue working with me, and I don't think I understood that at the time. But what he did do is he introduced me to Stan Winston um, uh, or, or when he was making Terminator. So uh, he did, he did uh, as we say, sent the elevator back down, so, um, yeah. and I took it to lingerie, fifth floor. <laughs> All of you guys from film school here, everybody? 
So I'm not a piece of alum, students, and, and other people that just heard about the event. So, oh, wow. Yeah. We were there. Where'd you all come from? <laughs> you know, one by one. I'll take your time. I thought we were coming down here to, to kind of hear your question rather than tell you our, you know. We'll, go, we'll get there. What an I know. I think so. Anyway. What no, it's not going to happen, she said. No. They're, they're saving up the good ones. All right, Pat, how about you? How did you uh, get involved with this? Oh, is this on? Yes. They're all from UCLA. Like, uh, I didn't go to film school. So I met, I was doing miniature work and I met. Uh, Alec and Jim Cameron, and they were driving in from Orange County to Venice, and I think Jim still owes you 15 bucks for gas. That, that's, that's, uh, but uh, I got a call from Robert Skotak. He said, oh, Jim's doing something. And I went down and I read the script. I had, he said, here's the script. Jim's coming in like an hour. I'm a very slow reader, and I read the script, and I knew Jim. You know, I knew his pretty talented guy. He'd already done Terminator at this point. And I read it, and I thought, holy shit, this is going to be an amazing film because I knew what he was capable of, and the rest was history. So it was. If you ever yeah. read the script, it, it is one of the few scripts that just reading, you totally smell the movie, see the movie. I remember having to put it down because I was like out of breath. Or, Jesus, this is frightening. Just on the page. One of the first things about Jim Cameron, and you tell me if this is true, he allegedly was writing simultaneously writing the script for Terminator Two. Ran Two, I guess, and this, like on three, he had three. Yeah, I think he would, at least two of them. Yeah, yeah. He's the story I heard is that he, that Fox had read the, his Terminator script, and then they asked him to pitch on this movie on Aliens, and then he went in to pitch on it, and the pitch didn't go great, and they didn't like his ideas, um, so he didn't get the job. But then Terminator got pushed here or something, or like nine months because Arnold was shooting Conan. And then Jim was just like so into this idea. He wrote 90 pages, and he like like a 90 page like scriptment. So it was part script, part like treatment. Gave it to Fox, and like this is awesome. And then they hired him for the job, and they waited till after. The story. You kept that secret because I didn't know that. Did you know that? I, I learned more stuff on, about this film on these panels. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Jim, I mean, he's a genius, and he, I don't think he's ever made a bad movie. Um, I hear he is very oh, yes, tough. Which one? Yes, he did. <laughs> we I was there. <laughs> we were down in Jamaica, and our budget was three hundred thousand dollars, and it was an Italian uh, kind of producer who was a, a real scammer. But anyway, so we probably had one hundred fifty thousand. And as as wardrobe for me, I bought a waiter's outfit. Because I was playing a harbor cop. I bought a wig. The guy had chinos, he was my size with a stripe down the side. And I said, good enough, paid him 75 bucks for it. Good a little budget. Anyway. Well, anyway, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to hear from each of you guys what, what were your experiences were like working with Jim? Because like, he's a master filmmaker right here, he's very tough on set. We are recording this, I want to be very careful about what I say. <laughs> he's, he's in New Zealand, he's not going to see it. Well, so sick. <laughs> what, um, who wants to start? What, what were some of your experiences working with Jim on this? I'm turning my chair backwards. <laughs> I ain't saying anything. He, his reputation, he's just, he's so clear about his vision, and he has unbelievable skill set to, like, see it and then design the stuff. If the, if the technology didn't exist, he would invent it, and he designed the prop, I mean, there are drawings of what I've just seen that, of his invention. So I think I think the British, you know, the British are a little bit more into manners than we might be. So they were had, you know, he was 29. How old was he when he made? He was a kid. He was 29, and they were going, well, "Who's this, you know, upstart?" But he was never uh, he was never anything but just focused, laser focused on getting every shot. And you know, here it is. It's still. A masterpiece. Yeah, I never get that when people say he, he was hard to work with because I didn't find him hard. I just found that, that he knew what he was doing, he knew what he wanted, and also the guy, any director is often preoccupied. I remember we were coming out of the AV one time and and we were talking about what we were going to do, and then I said, okay, Rico, you're going to lead it, but when you come out, he said, you know, I want you to come out and I want you to take off, and then you run over there, and he said something. I said, listen, uh, James, do, do I run left or do I run right? He went, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> that was it. But I understood because his, he, he, his mind was always preoccupied with what's going, what's going to happen next. But uh, I, I didn't really find him hard to work with, but I did find that he, as you said, had a clear view and was able to communicate that with actors. And also was able to give us enough room to, to play and find things ourselves. I mean, a lot of that stuff that happened at the breakfast table, a lot of that stuff was discovered at the breakfast table because he gave us enough room. I mean, a lot of that the, the back and forth between Bill and, and Arturian Poontain and, and she was a man and all that stuff, a lot of that stuff was just ad -lib. You know what, it, it all begins with the script, that's for sure. And definitely. And, and Jim wrote, when, he, when I read Aliens, I thought I had read, the opening line was, space like the love of God, cold and remote. I thought I read that. It wasn't in the script. So the point I'm trying to make is that it was as if he wrote something that you got you on a journey to start thinking like him. It was very well written. All his scripts were, you know, so are. I can't wait to see what happens with the There's a lot of uh, almost like haikus, half sentences, just words like coming at you. So even visually reading it, it was it was like um, like a storyboard. It was just like you wouldn't bother with flowery sentences. Like what was the thing? The Doberman's playing or something? Did they describe you? Oh, that's right. Like Doberman's playing. With yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Like the, the, your relationship. That was great. With Doberman's playing. It's just yeah. like dark. Bam. It was just like a like a comic book. But yeah, you were able to sort of. Uh, flesh out the character from the, the and it makes it a faster read too. Yeah. Uh, Pat, what do you be? What about you guys? Well, I, I, would, I would say that uh, that uh, Jim is very demanding, <laughs> and um, and he uh, oh there it is, he's very demanding. Um, uh, but as long as you're there and you know that what he's trying to get is the very best possible result, then any of the his roughness around the edges. Um, you just accept it. It's it's not a big deal. He was it was a really good testing ground for me as a as a young person to like you survive that and you, if you're able to put that personality type into perspective, um, you can work with anybody. And, I, and I've kind of I've, I've kind of carried that through. You know, I've worked with Paul Verhoeven and I've worked with some really tough people. But tough people are the ones who make it very clear where you stand and what they're looking for. So like I'd much prefer that than a person who's very sort of sullen and introspective and doesn't give you much feedback. I, when I worked with him on um, Titanic, there was a, a little, I, the, the two kids and the little boy, the little girl I guess had done something, but the little boy had just done a background in a McDonald's commercial. And when he did, they did the line, his one line, and Jim said, okay, right, we're going again. He was like, what? Didn't I do it okay? You know, he didn't, and you know, all the, everybody started to laugh and he said, quiet. You know, everyone quiet. And he went down, there were so many people there, and he just sort of went down to the little boy and said, have you, have you ever, do you know how they, we make movies? And you know, he goes, okay, so we've, I'm gonna do it once, and it's called The Master, and then I'm gonna, you do it like three times maybe, and then I'm gonna have you do it, and then I'm gonna put it on your mommy, and, and he goes, now you think you can do that? Is that okay? You know, and he was so quiet, and so sweet, and the little boy's like, and then he goes back in, so. That kid today, Judd Apatow. <laughs> Master. <laughs> Let's talk about it. It was, um, it was so much fun watching it on the big screen today. And the movie's just beautiful. And it, it's interesting watching from a uh, perspective. Like, as a little kid, you're not thinking about how they did this and stuff. It just kind of is. But, so, like, think of this movie before computer-generated effects. Like, I really don't know how you guys did this stuff. Um, Alex, did, did, you say, did you say when you watched it as a little kid? I saw this movie when I was 12, and I probably shouldn't have seen this movie when I was 12. We, when I, when we're, I we're old. You, it was, we're old. It was the, uh, it's right outside. 40th anniversary, so <laughs> yeah. I should tell you something. I told them before. I, this is, I, I think, still today was the tensest movie I've ever seen. Like, it's just the scariest, tensest film, and I, I loved it. But watching it again tonight, Alec, I was going to ask you, I heard um, in your imagination, it feels like there's hundreds of aliens there. Is it true there are only, like, five suits? Hey, hey, yeah. I think it was six. Let, let me let me let me make a point about what you just said. Okay. If you take and do one scene at a time over, say, two or three months, and then you put it all together, you squeeze it down even more, and you're going to look at it in an hour and a half or two hours, just the energy compression is overwhelming. And, yeah, 
We didn't do it all in a day or two hours. That's for sure. Oh, but it was never leisurely. I, and I, I just have this image of Jim would be filming something and then he would run to another stage and work on miniatures yeah. and get back and come back and do. It was, right. It was a, it was a sprint, and we it was four months. Budget, huh? But look at the power of that of that finished thing. It's taking months of energy, and not only that, but the the energy it took to put it together, you know, and squeeze it into two hours. How could you not be impressed? Because they've suspended you. You know, you're you're done. You got to watch it. You know. What I mean? Well, one advantage Jim had was that he had done a short film, and this is how he got the job at uh, at Corman's, and uh, he got some money from some dentists or lawyers, and he did this thing called Xenogenesis. And when I saw it, it blew me away. It had robots in it, it had lasers firing, so he, and I, I think you were working with him about that time, but, but because of Corman's, he, he was a model maker, and he started shooting visual effects, and later he was a... Uh, 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 art director on another crappy Corman movie, Galaxy of Terror. So he had done all, he had been around visual effects, special effects, art direction, so he knew all the technical side. So when he, it came to Aliens, he was really smart about stretching the dollar, because a lot of the stuff we did in the visual effects uh, were done with just just almost junk. There, when everybody walked in, I had some, there were photos running here. I think you saw something. There's, there's a, a lot of, picture of these old lamps, they, they burned everything out in the back for some reason, pilot. they lit everything on fire to get rid of it. But a lot of the debris from the miniatures, the, the colony complex, Bob Skotak and I went out and just literally got a wheelbarrow and I said, hey, you know, this is free, you know. So, so Jim thought that way, he was very smart about putting things together, the cheapest, because there really was a low budget movie and it looks like, it, it looks like it's a, a huge budget Hollywood movie. And it really was Jim. And going back to the script, his script writing is so tight, and he has this sort of economy of words, and he gets his, his ideas across very clearly. And I was sort of lower on the food chain doing the model stuff, but I needed to talk to Jim. I'd go up and say, what do you want? And he could draw it for me, because he's a really good artist. He designed most of the movie. The power loader, the weapons, the uh, the queen, the dropship. The drop uh, so, yeah, and he was. I worked on the Abyss and, and True Lies, and yeah, I mean, he was to be difficult, but in, in, in Abyss, this is the thing that always amazes me. In the Abyss, he learned, which is all underwater, and he learned, and that's where he got into scuba, uh, to diving, he became a master of that, and then he ends up not only take he invents and creates, uh, designs the sub pod that goes to the lowest point uh, of in the ocean that a mankind has ever gone, and he just did that. What? It didn't exist, let me design that. He designed it, and then he went in it, and he did it. I'm like, okay, good for you. That's <laughs> you know what? I made some beautiful, beautiful eggs this morning, that's what I did. If you think, um, <laughs> if you think of Cameron as uh, the wolf in Rome, and you have Romulus and Remus nursing on it, <laughs> we're like more the Romulus and Remus. <laughs> we walk in and the thing's already set up. You know, so we have a different um, a job to do and a different uh, experience. Like we walk in, a lot of, like look at what we're doing right now. We're walking into a room full of people. Yeah, but it's rare. It's I didn't set this up. You did. You know, so <laughs> right. But, but like the alien movie. But to 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 your one of your 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 uh, statement about it, it kind of like holding its own even forty years later. I remember probably about 10 years ago, I was flipping through the television and I, the, the movie was on, so I just thought, well, let me look at a little bit of it and see how it holds up. And I was surprised at that point that it did hold up so well. And I think the reason why was because he did use practicals as opposed to the special effects. Often when you see a, a sci-fi movie, and you guys know this if you're a real sci-fi fan, you can almost tell what decade it was in by the special effects. But when you don't use special effects, now you have no idea, and I think James was really a master at that. And that, that probably came partly because he, maybe he had that sort of uh, foresight, but also being a, a low-budget movie, I think the movie was made for something like 18, pound, 18 million pounds or dollars, I'm not sure, but that, that was even low for, for, for that time. 
Well, Jim knew the, all the in-camera stuff and the SCOTAC, so it was, and we didn't have the money to do things optically. Mm -hmm. So really, he really knew how we could stretch. And it's, it's sort of, it's, I look at movies of, of the year on, you know, the 80s, and the, the optical stuff is awful, matte lines and stuff. And this, I, I'm astonished at how well it holds up, just everything across the board, the acting, the and, art and, direction. And if you, if you free, go through it frame by frame, it's still almost impossible to tell when it's cutting to miniatures and when it's like, it's just so brilliant. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to ask you guys. The, the one shot that struck me today was when the, uh, the whatever you call it, what's the, the, the ship that's flying down? Drop yeah, the drop ship. When, uh, when the vehicle comes out of the drop ship and starts driving, I'm like, I have no idea how they did that. How did you guys? How did you guys do well, that shot? I was the done. Plans, the, <laughs> drop, the drop ship was about this tall. It was it was twelfth scale, and we had a little APC that would back into it. We had a whole set. But when you see it driving towards you, you see the the drop ship peeling off. That's the twelfth scale drop ship, and the the fifth scale APC in the foreground, and they're actually very close together. But because of the the size and all the smoke in the air, it just totally looks like it's way back there. Did you, is, was there ever actually a full-size APC, or is that all yes. the Okay, yeah, It went about four when miles an hour. Driving? Yeah, it was, okay. it was an airport tug, and it, weighed, it literally would pull 747s around, it could, and it weighed literally tons. Yeah, and it could hardly go, they undercranked, which, you know, they ran the film slow to make it go, because it only go like five or six miles an hour, uh, the, the full-size one. And then the, the miniature is what you see driving, you know, when Ripley's driving up and down, and that's the... That's the that's and and the, another great illusion of, with, with, with the APC is that if you stood next to it, like your, your head, you could look over the top of it practically. But somehow when you're inside and it's this different set, it, it's very roomy and spacious. <laughs> and, and there's no way all those people would fit inside that thing, but it doesn't matter. And that's part of Cameron's boldness as well. He knows what he's going to get away with. Well, let's get back to you. Let's get back to the creatures. We got we got 